Has anyone uh, seen a mortared natural stone project before where the mortar joints actually start to break because there's water that gets in there? If something moves, it's going to break, okay? Now what happens if you don't use polymeric sand? Absolutely nothing. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I started in this business 15 years ago. I actually started here. I worked at the old Burnsville location. Has anyone been around long enough to know where that old Burnsville location was? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, we used to cook Hot Pockets on the roof. It was in the little gravel pit. It was actually really kind of fun. Um, so when I first started in this, polymeric sand was very, very new. There were only a handful of people that actually used it. We just used regular graded sand, compacted it in place. You'd leave a five gallon bucket of sand with a homeowner and say, hey, once this washes out, sweep it in a little bit and you're done. Then all this new stuff started coming out and it actually works extremely well. But there is still no one size fits all product. Okay, even though a lot of these sands have now become foolproof, uh, very easy to use, there is no such thing as a one size fits all. Certain projects are going to require flexibility, certain projects are going to require rigidity, and that's, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Now, we carry two different types of polymeric sand, we carry one type of sealer. The polymeric sand is very easy to remember. If you're doing pavers, you're going to use our poly sweep. If you're doing stone, we actually recommend using gator dust. The sealer, we do BP. Obviously, that's where I came from. Um, be nice and easy to talk about. Polymeric sand. There's two different types of binders. There's organic binders and there's cement. Organic gets blended in with synthetic binders as well. Organic and synthetic are actually a little bit easier to install. They have more flexibility, okay? They're made in a lab. Um, there's different terminologies that use them. Then you have cement-based products, which are Portland. Biggest problem with cement-based products is they actually have more hazing. Has anyone done a polymeric sand project before and hazed it? Has anybody seen hazing before? Okay. That's the reason why we chose to go with our poly sweep. Poly sweep gives us the flexibility to use it on wider joint products, narrower joint products with less chance of hazing. Sealers, two different types of sealers. There's water-based and solvent-based. Water-based sealers are traditionally easier to work with. Solvent-based sealers give you a little bit more of a wet look. How many guys use poly sand on every job? Do you guys charge out for it? Or is it just, you're doing a project, it's getting poly sand in the joints? standard. About 10 years ago, it never used to be standard. People started seeing the bag of a sand and it was 22 bucks, 23 bucks for a bag of sand versus buying it in bulk for nine bucks a ton. Nowadays, it's just the cost of doing it. Okay, what people don't do is they don't necessarily incorporate sealer and sealer is a good revenue stream and it is something that helps kind of maintain and protect certain installations. With paper technologies that are coming out, specifically in fusion, there are a lot of added benefits to new, I call it batter. The new batter in Willow Creek paving stones basically makes it so you don't have to seal to preserve it. But the sealer does give it a little bit of a, a catalog look. Now the catalog look is something that we talk about basically if you look around the industry, there's projects that have that deep dark color or, and I was guilty of this too, whenever you get done doing a project, you always take the picture after you get done wetting it down, right? Because that's where you get the most color, the most pop, the most bang for things. That's what the sealer will actually do. This one should look familiar. Is it still the front page of the catalog? No? Well, it was. 
It's on one of these boards back here. This one was sealed with wet look. I actually did this one. Uh, it was a really, really nice install. Can't remember who did it. It was probably about five years ago. But that made the front page of the catalog three years ago. I think your batteries are dying on this, Jim. This one was done last year. It was about 8,000 square feet. That actually set the record for the quickest I've ever been able to install sealer. We were wrapped up and done in an hour and a half on that one. That one was fun. Uh, permeable installs. Anyone done permeable installs before? Uh, anyone ever stabilized permeable installs before? So BP actually makes a, a permeable chip stabilizer. So a lot of driveway applications that we did. This one was done in Chicago. It was actually a little suburb outside of there. And they were having chip loss by tires going over the top of it. And up until about four years ago, there was no solution to that they came up with a stabilizer that you can actually pour into the joints and it locks it in place. Wet cast, particularly the stones that we have over there, uh, the dimensional flagging from Rosetta. That was a project in Chicago as well. This project was actually kind of cool. It was one of those ritzy neighborhoods outside of Chicago where they actually paid to keep their address off of Google Maps. It was the first time I've ever seen that before. Uh, the directions that I had was go to the stop sign. There'll be a school on your right. Take a left. Okay, do you have an address for me? No, I don't. Road doesn't even have a name. Anyone ever been to the Egan Outlet Mall? Same property owner that did that, did this one in Clarksburg, Maryland. This one was 135,000 square feet. They did polymeric sand and sealer on that one as well. So catalog look. Again, this in a portfolio, quick and easy. Install. This is a local contractor that did this one. I love this picture because this actually talks a lot about, guys, life is going to happen, okay? There's paver installs that have been done 15, 20 years ago that, quite frankly, look like crap, okay? A simple power wash, coming back, doing new polymeric sand, and doing some sealer in this thing is actually going to breathe a little bit of life into it. There's two different types of cleaning. There's general cleans and there's stain cleaning. General cleans are often done with mild detergents. Dawn dish soap. Every time I went out to a problem project, it was always hilarious because I told people to bring a bottle of Dawn dish soap. All right, here I am. I just flew out to New York to go and take care of a problem project. I tell the guy to go buy a bottle of $4 dish soap. Should always have that in your tool bag. Stain cleaning typically requires acid cleaning. Before you get into an acid clean, please make sure that you reach out to one of the reps that we have here. Obviously, I'm part of the team now, so we all kind of talk to each other. If you ever run into a problem, use us as a resource. I can promise you right now that there is nothing that you will see that I haven't dealt with. An average year, I used to actually install right around a million square feet of sealer. Cleaner, not that much, but I mean, I, you'll run into it from t time to time. When you're cleaning a project, always make sure you do a test area first, okay? Very important. You'll hear that with cleaners, sealers, polymeric sands. Anytime you get into something that's a little bit abnormal, make sure you test it out. Okay, it's easier to fix a little two by two area than it is to fix an entire thing. So always important to do a little test area. Always start with a weaker solution and work your way up stronger as you need to. So this right here is actually cleaning. Uh, we did polymeric sand haze on this one. This was in Omaha, Nebraska. Notice the shorts. Don't acid clean with shorts, please. I still have chemical burns from that project. I put this in a watering can and then I'll just dump it on the surface. 
I'll usually spray it on the entire thing. You can use a pump sprayer. The most important part when you're doing it, the reason why I uh, shot this video this way is because a lot of times people don't use enough cleaner when they're actually trying to take care of these projects. What they do is they move bubbles around. So they clean a little area and then you try to stretch it a little bit farther than it should go. Cleaning is all about contact time. So I'm working in little square areas, letting it sit on the surface. Typically you want to let it sit for about 30 seconds. Doesn't have to be longer than that. Got a couple of guys bringing in a scrub brush. You're not training for the Iron Man when you're scrubbing. All you're doing is just a light agitation, okay? You can see them overlapping lines. Again, we're not moving bubbles around because we covered the entire area. That's what we're looking for. We want the cleaner to do the work. We're just doing this to agitate a little bit. And then very important to rinse it after you're done. Now, I start the furthest away from where my rinse point is, and I'll work my way into the edge, because you want to make sure that you rinse the entire thing completely. Where that becomes important is when you get to the middle of the patio, and you start running your water, and you just move it to the next part of the patio. Well, when that dries, it's uh, actually going to leave some residue on there. It's like you've, if you've ever ran your dishes in a dishwasher before and you put too much soap in there, you pull your dishes out and it's got a little bit of scum on it. It's exactly what happens. After I'm done, I always run a dryer. Any questions on cleaning? Polymeric sand. You can use pretty much whatever you want on any particular product. You just want to make sure that your joint size is correct. So anything above, what's SEK say, Bert? Anything above an inch, you want to get into their extreme? Okay, so anything under an inch, which is typically going to be your joint size, you can use our poly sweep. Anything bigger than that, we recommend using Extreme or the Gator Dust. Always have a leaf blower with you, a push broom, garden hose. A good trick too, throw a, um, a nozzle in your truck and keep it. Don't always uh, think that the homeowner is going to have one because I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out to a site there isn't a nozzle there and then you end up just taking the end of the hose and putting your thumb over the top of it trying to get it somewhat close. Yeah, don't do that. Just throw one in your truck. Anyone done that before? Come on. It, I can't be the only one. All right. Thank you. You got to do what you got to do to get done, you know. Pre-compacting pavers. This is very, very important. When we get into the video, it does not show that, but I always recommend when you're done with the project and you snapped your edging and you're getting ready to fill in your sand joints, run the compactor over the pavers. Okay? In larger slabs, like CJ just said, you actually cannot run compactors on. Those are unique uh, situations. You can't do it. You're going to end up breaking it. It is what it is. But in your traditional installs, it's always good practice to run a compactor over it. What it does is it actually sets the pavers down into the bedding sand and creates a grid underneath so it helps hold it in place. Sand joint heights. The number one problem that I ran into with sand joint failure was sand joint height. They were too high. Okay, everyone here has probably run into the homeowner before that says, oh, I want as much sand in this thing as I possibly can. They always want it completely flush to the top and it is not the right way to do it. If you do run into that situation, and I guarantee you everyone in this room will, make sure that you let them know that if there are any sand joint issues, sand joint that's cracking, flaking, washing out, you will not come back and take care of that because anything outside of this chamfer, which is where it starts to go at an angle and it stops going vertical, has no interlock whatsoever. It will break. It might not be the first day, 
but it will not hold up. If you overfill sand joints and you go above the chamfer, you will have problems. Now, if a homeowner is adamant about it, make sure that you explain to them this is not the right way to do it. If they still want you to, which a lot of them still will, at least you tried. So we're going to get into the installation video here. The ultimate paving stone sand joint stabilizer. Let us show you how easy it is to apply. Now remember, they're not going to show this, but make sure that you pre-compact the pavers in place. Weather that is very, very important. Consideration in the installation process. Prior to installation, it is important the pavement surface and joints are completely dry. Check the local forecast and make sure there is no rain expected for at least 12 hours. I don't know how. Installation. Also, the temperature is important. Poly sweep should only be installed while the ambient air temperature is expected to be above. Go up. Again. How do I pause this thing as I'm going? You hit the pause button. Oh, that just makes the so much sense. The ultimate paving stone sand joint stabilizer. Let us show you how easy it is to apply and achieve long-term results that will maintain your hardscape for years. The weather conditions must be your first consideration in the installation process. Prior to installation, it is important the pavement surface and joints are completely dry. Check the local forecast and make sure there is no rain expected for at least 12 hours post-installation. Also, the temperature is important. Poly sweep should only be installed while the ambient air temperature is expected to be above 45 degrees Fahrenheit for at least four hours prior and eight hours after installation. Because this product contains no Portland cement, the curing process for poly sweep could take up to 24 hours based on temperature and humidity level. Cool, damp, and overcast conditions will slow the rate at which poly sweep sets up. Over the top of properly compacted pavers, distribute a bag of poly sweep evenly over a 50 to 75 square foot area. Everyone just see how he poured the bag on top of the pavers? Don't do that either, please. What you want to do is you actually want to cut the top of the bag, flip it upside down, and drag it along the patio. It's a little tidbit that I picked up. It keeps the dust down, uh, keeps things a little bit more controlled. This is the typical coverage rate for poly sweep, although coverage will vary depending on joint width and depth. With a broom, sweep poly sweep into the joints until they are completely full. Do not use any filler material. Poly sweep should be used for the full depth of the paver joint. Avoid sweeping poly sweep over great distances as this could cause separation of the sand and polymers. Run a vibrating plate. Okay, they said do not push poly sweep until the very end of the bag and then dump on again. Um, I see that a lot. So in blended products, I see people that will try to stretch it all the way through because you don't want to crack another bag. It's very important, especially when you're doing your initial fill, make sure that you have enough on the surface and you don't sweep this thing to the very end. Particularly in blended products, what ends up happening is when you pour it on the area and you start sweeping it, you might have a higher concentration of polymers in one area, and as you start to work your way down, it might get less. So if you keep a consistent, good-sized pile on there, you're always making sure that you have enough polymers throughout the entire project. Now, once the project has been swept, you're not done. You want to actually run your compactor over the surface so it vibrates the sand down into the joints. I know a lot of people that don't do that. What it does is it'll actually create voids. So if this is the size of the paver right here, I'm going to try to do it and hold this at the same time, you'll have a little air pocket right here. So you'll have sand underneath, you'll have sand on top, and when those pavers move and start to vibrate, it will actually drop the sand from the top into the bottom, and it'll look like you had sand loss on there. It's very important to compact your pavers, specifically when you're sweeping in your sand. 
You'll see right here that he left some sand on top of the surface as he was compacting. Don't do that. What you're doing is you're grinding everything into the surface of that paver. It's a lot easier to actually sweep the entire project, put it into a pile, start your compactor, and then have a guy right behind you start sweeping again. That way you're constantly working on the exact same project. Compactor over the pavers to allow the vibrations to settle the sand particles and eliminate voids in the joint sand. Sweep any additional poly sweep required to fill the joints so after to within compact, one eighth inch they of the swept top again. of the paver. Do not overfill the joint as this could cause unwanted particles to end up on the top of the paver surface. Use the vibrating plate compactor once again to perform the final compaction and settling of poly sweep. Using a broom, thoroughly sweep off any excess poly sweep from the paver surface. Can anybody tell me when the final compaction should happen? When are you done? When the sand doesn't drop anymore. So as you're going, always pick out one pass line. And it's usually where the wider joints are, especially if you're coming up against an area that you had to cut in place or something. Pick an area that when you run your compactor over the top, if you do one pass and the sand doesn't drop or move anymore, you're done. Until then, final compaction can take one time on wider joints. It can take three times. I've had to take up to five. There is no right or wrong answer. There's no magic bullet. I can't tell you that if you have half inch joints, you can only do it once. If you have quarter inch joints, it's gonna take three. Every project is gonna be different. You're done when the sand doesn't drop anymore. Holding a leaf blower at a slight angle and running at a slow idle, Blow off any excess sand or dust. So when they're the getting ready to wet it down, they'll take the blower and they'll blow everything the off the surface. This step. Try to run it at Starting idle if at you one can. End of the project, using a garden hose or tank sprayer. Gently On your spray wetting process, you want to mist it real quick to actually set it in and place. To activate the polymers. And then you're going to mist we it three or four more times to get it to shower. Not greater than 500 square feet at a time during the activation step. Uh -huh. Allow the joints to absorb the water for approximately five minutes and then mist again. What? Repeat one or two more times, gradually adding more water volume in these final applications. Be certain to add enough water to saturate the entire sand joint. While it is important not to apply too much water so quickly so as to flood the pavers or allow sand to float out of the joints and onto the paver surface, care must be taken to add enough water to the joints to saturate the entire depth of the jointing sand. You can check this by removing the sand from the joint using a small screwdriver and inspecting the material to make sure it is saturated the entire depth. Any material removed for inspection can be replaced into the joint. If you are installing poly sweep on a dimpled or textured surface So once surface you guys are paper, done wetting it, take your blower, blower and blow all the excess moisture off. To remove any excess moisture Just or helps it dry, helps it not puddle. The low areas of the surface. Helps it kind of move a Care little bit Care should better. be taken to avoid blowing out poly sweep from the joints. Um, you heard him say to actually use a screwdriver to check the joint uh, depth. What that basically means is they want you to dig out a little joint area, make sure that you got it wet all the way through and through. Um, I never used a screwdriver. What I used was a metal coat hanger and I'd break the tip off and I'd just use that and I'd go into a corner where the paver was, go up a little bit, make sure that it got all the way through, put the sand back in place, score it kind of like your tuck pointing mortar. And as long as it got through, ch check three or four different areas. Don't just check one joint and expect that the entire thing's that way. Sealer. Water-based and solvent-based have the exact same uh, requirements as polymeric sand does. You want to make sure that it's a little bit warmer uh, throughout your installation. Once it drops below 45 degrees, it gets a little bit uh, touchy. Solvent-based sealers tend to dry a little bit quicker. 
They're rain safe in about 90 minutes. So if you're going out and you're doing a, a real light coat to make the colors pop, as long as you don't have any rain forecasted for 90 minutes after you're done, spray away. Now instead of going over equipment, we're going to take a peek at the video here. Ceiling retaining walls, salt protection, mold protection, moisture protection. Not a lot of people do it. I recommend using the invisible on this one. It does not change the look. It does not change the surface. All it does is gives it protection, okay? The other nice thing about the invisible sealer is you really don't have to be all that careful with it. Now, don't go spraying a Mercedes Benz that's sitting in the driveway, but it's a little bit more forgiving. As I'm spraying, I'll spray from the top and work my way down to the bottom, so that way if there's any puddling, I can actually push it all the way down. Split face block will always absorb more than a paver will, so it's recommended to do two coats. Is that what? Plant friendly? Um, yeah, water based is typically plant friendly. I wouldn't crack a five gallon pail and let it soak in the yard by any means, but uh, it's a little more plant friendly. You can also see the flip flops, that's recommended footwear for this as well. What's that? Yes, yeah, you can, but the problem is, is so the, uh, what he said is you can saturate it before you start sealing, so water your plants. The problem that you have with that is if it's close to the project area that you're working on, you'll get drips. So it's just easier to be a little bit more careful. Now this is spraying water based on top of flat work. This is actually being used as a joint stabilizer, so you can use a sealer to harden up the sand. Okay, it's flooding on top of the surface. This was a really cool project. This was right on the ocean in New Jersey. But as you can see, we're going back and forth, working our way through. You see how it's kind of pushing that puddle into the joints as I'm spraying it? That's what we're looking for. Then of course, I always yell at your shield guy. Keep going, keep going. Paper's a product that we sell too, Unilock Art Line. We carry it in stock. There's a little plug for them. Now once you saturate the joints, it's very important to get it off the surface. You don't want to let it sit and dry on there like that. You can use a squeegee if it's a flat texture. If it's got dimples on it, I recommend using a roller, not a squeegee. Don't overextend your guy too. As you can see there, I'm making him reach for the stars. He's a tall guy, I'm not, so he can do it. But you want to work in smaller sections where you don't have to go all the way over it and then work your way back. So nothing crazy. We're not trying to get too technical with this. Uh, all, we, all we did is spray it on the surface, let it soak, and then squeegee it off. It really is that easy. As I spray to move on to the next area, I overlap and you can see it on this one as well. You can see that I'm not just spraying the dry areas, I'm actually overlapping a little bit on the back side. Now I'm running the shield against the, the sliding glass door there because I don't want to buy a new one. On the retaining wall, I probably would do that as well. You just want to be a little bit more careful with it. I'm spraying solvent based on this one. That is exactly what it's going to look like when it's dry. This is a power spray application. So if you get into larger areas, you can contact us and we can get you set up with one of those. You can do about 1,000 to 2,000 square feet an hour with a power system.
So that's pretty much how hard sealer is. Spray it, make sure you spray it on evenly and walk away. If you're doing a flood coat like we did in that water-based project, you want to squeegee and make sure you get the puddles off. If all you're doing is sealing it, just a light coat. Question was, what would I recommend, water or solvent? Um, I like both of them. I do like water because it's a little bit more forgiving in weather conditions. What I don't like about water-based sealers is if something goes wrong, it's a lot more difficult to fix. Solvent-based sealers, if something do, uh, does go wrong, I can fix it without having to strip it. Has anyone here ever stripped a project before? Yeah? Not fun. Not fun at all. It'll be the last time you ever want to do that. So. Water-based is a little bit more forgiving and it's good on a lot of textures. Solvent-based I can fix without having to go through the nonsense. Anyone have a horror story on Sealer before we look at the wall of fame and wall of shame? Yeah? What do you got? Polyzan? What do you got? Yep. Oh, good. Yep. Yep. You were getting a tight timeline on this one. It was, yep, yep. Yep, yep. It was the cement based. Did you, did you get it fixed? A lot of elbow grease. A lot of elbow grease. So that happens more often than not. Uh, what he ran into was he installed the entire thing, got it swept, got it ready to go. A guy came through and power washed the deck, blew out all the poly sand on, on, on top of the patio, and you were caught. Basically, you had to fix it, right? Had nothing to do with you, but the next day you show up and go, oh, sh what happened? Um, it's one of the reasons why we picked what we pick because it's a lot easier to clean than taking four days for 900 square feet. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, every single product has the uh, opportunity to haze and have issues. We're all gonna push the timelines, we're all gonna try to push the temperature barriers. This product right here is a lot easier to fix when you do push that. Everyone in this room has probably done a project and poly sanded in November or December because it's 40 during the day. It's not going to drop down until midnight at night or it's going to rain at midnight, which means you have seven hours, not 12. Uh, everyone in here has done it. If you haven't, good for you. I would actually like to use you for my presentations from now on. But cement-based products, it is kind of one of the hard things because those are more prone to hazing and those do require a lot of chemical acids. Muratic, hot water pressure washers, you name it, all the fun stuff. Anyone else have a war story? I actually kind of enjoy these because I've gotten into some really good ones too. Oh, that's good. That's real good. So we'll just kind of blow through this real quick. Wall of Fame, this was the uh, front page of the Willow catalog. This one was done last year, nice little driveway. Same one that you already saw. That was in uh, Landscape Omaha. That was the shopping center. This was the front entryway to a hospital. I do like showing this one because you will inevitably get this question, is wet looks slippery? Someone will ask you that. Uh, no, it is not. As long as the surface that you're putting it on is not slippery, it's not gonna make it more slippery. Okay, the front entryway to a hospital, you can imagine there was a lot of hoops that we had to jump through on that one. We sealed it with wet look, no problem. This one, 
real quick. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Am I doing okay? Okay. Um, so this project right here, there's underground parking underneath it. It was a new hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they were having sand joint loss. So we just sealed this thing to help kind of make it shine a little bit. <laughs> In order to fix the sand joint loss, they had to actually correct the drainage. Well, no one, I guess, really thought about this, that it was underground parking underneath. To fix the drainage, they decided to drill weep holes in the base. Is that registering with anybody yet? So all that water that was on the surface is now going down into the parking garage. Uh, didn't really fix it. I washed my hands of it and said, guys, I, we just sealed it. That's really all I cared about. But still to this day, I think that they haven't corrected that. I, I, I don't know. I got the heck out of there, to be honest with you. This was a cool one. Uh, I believe it's Suncast uh, plastic products. They make those plastic hose reels and sheds and all that stuff. That's the owner's house. He has four identical homes to this. They all are million-dollar mansions. Uh, this was a wet cast project in Omaha, Nebraska. It was a pool deck area. Again, goes back to wet look doesn't really get that slippery unless it's slippery to begin with. Another cool wet cast project. This was in uh, Ohio. It was actually just outside of Columbus. I liked it because they had the banding in that thing. The one thing I wish they did do was actually do some banding in the fire pit area. This is kind of that catalog look. You can see down in the corner there, that's what it would have looked like if they didn't actually seal this thing. They did do polymeric sand in this one. Joints held up great. They just wanted a little bit more wow factor. That's a Malibu project. Here's a nice wall of shame. That's polymeric sand haze. That was one of the worst that I've seen. We did get it cleaned. This one was just outside of Chicago as well. If you look, you can actually see halfway through that circle and down. The entire thing is hazed. On the top side, it's actually cleaned and fixed. Uh, sand joints were rocking and breaking out, and the slope, it was actually all slope, so their biggest issue was down at the bottom of this apron. They chose to do a joint stabilizing sealer so they could get a little bit more rigid on their system. They actually should have done a flexible polymeric system. Any kind of a drive application when you have larger pavers, the pavers tend to move a little bit more. So we actually recommend putting something that's flexible in there versus rigid. That was another good one too. I think that's all I got. If you guys have questions, come chat with me.